Good morning, church. Welcome. And let's stand and praise Jesus. Best Church, good morning and welcome to worship as we gather together this morning to lift praise before God and give to him all that is due him and the honor that's due his name. Thank you for being here, for joining us this morning. There is a blue card in the pew rack somewhere probably just in front of you. We would love for you to take that card, fill it out and drop it off at the kiosk, which is just out and around to the right outside this door. And if you do that this morning, we've got a gift for you. We would love to give to you just a way to say thank you uh, for joining us and uh, lending us that information so that we can be in touch with you. Our solemn promise, we won't fill your email address with spam. We will just contact you to say thank you for joining us this morning. So if you're new this morning, grab one of those cards and fill that out. I wonder this morning, I saw a news story this week that made me think about expectation. When you come to worship each Sunday morning, what do you expect to hear from God or do you even expect to hear from God? I would hope that when you come, your expectation is that God has something for you this morning that he wants to communicate. Maybe you saw this story. 
It happened in Colorado, the state I came from 11 years ago to come here to, to Wabash. And as you probably know, in Colorado, there are a lot of mountains. And when you have a lot of mountains, you have a lot of mountain climbers. And so this particular story had to do with some uh, gentleman that was climbing one of the peaks, about 14,000 feet or so, <laughs> just, just a short little climb. And as he was climbing the peak, he got lost. He was going to backtrack and follow his tracks on down the hill, but the wind had come up and had, had obliterated his tracks, and so he wasn't sure where to go, but the search and rescue folks knew he was gone because he had overstayed his, uh, his return time, so they decided to try to get a hold of him. Well, he was on the side of the mountain with a phone that was ringing because in that area you get great reception because, I mean, it's kind of like the city, the mountaintop, you, God, there's nothing in between there. His phone was ringing. It was search and rescue trying to get a hold of him to find out if he was okay. He didn't answer the phone because he didn't recognize the number. <laughs> that goes under one of those categories entitled, I can't help you if dot, dot, dot. He didn't have any expectation that he would hear from anyone. And so when he didn't recognize the number, he didn't answer as it was search and rescue saying, are you okay? What are you expecting to hear from God this morning? Are you thinking that he may or may not show up? You know, his word tells us that when two or more of us are gathered together in his name, that he's here in the midst of us. Well, there's a few more than two of you this morning. So that means God is here too. Amen. So let's attune our ears to hear what it is he might want to say to us this morning. Thank you for being here. Welcome to worship this morning.
mercy is more. When I could remember the wrongs we had done, omniscient all our weak, he cast at the sun, thrown into the sea with a bottom or shore. Our sins they are many, his mercy. for the greatness of your mercy. And we thank you that you give to us exactly what it is that we need from you, your grace and your mercy. And in spite of the, the largeness of our sin, the greatness of your mercy overcomes. And for that, we're grateful. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And if you'd watch the screen for our children's message this morning, kids, look this direction. Paul was a prisoner in Caesarea. He had asked to see Caesar about his case. Caesar was the leader of the Roman Empire. So Paul got on a ship with other prisoners going to Rome. The journey was difficult. Strong winds and rain tossed the ship. The crew threw things overboard and tried to keep the ship from breaking apart. But the storm did not stop for many days. All the people on the ship were afraid they would die. One night, God sent an angel to Paul. The angel told Paul not to be afraid. God would save the lives of everyone on the ship. Paul told everyone on board what God had said. Take courage, he said. Paul believed everything would happen just like God said. The people on the ship would not die. They would have to run the ship onto an island. When the ship got close to an island, some of the sailors tried to escape in the lifeboat. Paul told them they would only be saved if they stayed on the ship. The sailors listened to Paul. No one had eaten in a long time, so Paul told them to eat. 
He thanked God and broke the bread, and everyone ate. Then they raised the sails and headed toward the island. When they got close, the ship struck a sandbar and stopped. The waves crashed into the ship and it began to break into pieces. The soldiers were afraid the prisoners would escape, so some of them wanted to kill the prisoners. But an army officer ordered everyone to swim for shore. Those who could not swim clung to the planks and pieces of the ship. They all made it safely to shore. Paul was right. God saved all of their lives. Three months later, Paul got onto another ship and sailed to Rome. Paul was still a prisoner, but instead of going to jail, Paul was allowed to live by himself in a house. A soldier stayed with him to guard him. People came to Paul's house and listened to him speak about the kingdom of God and about Jesus. Some of the people believed and followed Jesus. Paul trusted God to keep his promise to rescue them from the storm. He encouraged the sailors to trust and obey God too. God calls us to trust in his son Jesus, who died to rescue us from sin and death, and to tell the others this good news. I love how the white paper bag was God. We're the brown ones. <laughs> Well, kids, we're going to pray. We're going to dismiss you to Children's Church. But first, I just want to say happy Halloween. And, you know, Halloween wasn't always about spooky, scary skeletons and things like that. It was once a Christian holiday. We called it All Hallows Eve. And it was always the day before All Saints Day. All Saints Day is always November 1st. And Halloween is always the day before that Christian holiday. And Christians would uh, fast and pray and get ready for the big meal that happens on November 1st. So it's okay to think of Jesus on Halloween. Uh, it can be a time where you say, hey, thanks, God. Thanks for Halloween. That, was, that, was, that started with you. And I always thought that was pretty cool about God and Halloween. Let's pray, and then let's send you off to Children's Church, okay? God, we thank you so much that you're a fun God, and we want to celebrate Halloween with you. We think of you this day. Uh, help us learn a lot about you in Children's Church, and we love you very much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, see you later, kiddos. Have a fun time. I'd like to invite Sandy Cancro to come on up. Here she comes. Sandy's going to tell us a little bit more about Winter Shelter this year. Here we are. That should be ready for you. Good morning. I love those kids' videos. They're great. Okay, winter shelter last year was canceled basically because of COVID. So this year it's happening, but in a different format. In your bulletin, you will find this piece of paper. Uh, and it talks about that. So it will happen this year, but it's not going to go from church to church. Instead, Hope Lutheran will host it, but it's going to be on a severe weather um, type thing. So, and that is described as uh, forecast below 32 degrees or three inches of snow kind of thing. And they still do need volunteers, though it will be set up exactly the way it was when it was hosted at each individual church. So we need people who are willing to drive them from the pickup place at Calvary Church to Hope Lutheran, which is the sponsoring church in Enumclaw, or the hosting church. We still need people to uh, prepare and do dinner and breakfast and serve it and stay to help clean up, to help sanitize after, uh, the, after the night is over, and then to drive our guests back to uh, Calvary Presbyterian Church in the morning. I need help, uh, help with sign-in. Um, let's see, if you can help with any of those things, uh, instead of having sign-ups here at the church, you can call in to Plateau Outreach Ministries. The number is listed on this flyer. And also, if you're new to Winter Shelter and feel like you would have more questions or need more orientation, there will be a meeting at the summit in Enumclaw on November 15th at 7 p.m. 
or you can contact uh, Pastor Keith Marshall at Hope Lutheran, and his email address is also on this flyer. Um, I think that's about it. I will be out in the lobby after church if you do have any questions about it and would like to talk a little bit more about what I'll unveil. Oh, and our guests are screened, so you're not going to be working uh, with people who have felony arrests or domestic violence charges against them, so that's, uh, you know, or, or current drug users, that kind of thing. And uh, volunteers will be screened as well. So we, everything is kept above board and safe as can possibly be. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. And so if uh, you would like to help out a very, very worthy ministry, um, you might want to check out that meeting um, at, uh, at uh, the summit and become involved that way. Mm. We're back this way a little bit uh, this morning because we had some lighting issues and that was going to affect how things went out on the live stream. And so that's the reason for a little bit of a redesign up here this morning. A few announcements uh, as uh, we get ready to go to prayer and then go to the Word this morning. You may have noticed coming in the, uh, the return of the espresso. Uh, I know for some of you that this is major day. Hopefully you're caffeinated enough before you got here, but just in case you need that little extra boost. Um, through a lot of hard work by Aaron Sauer, um, the, the new espresso machine is installed and up and running. So as, as a welcome home to the espresso machine, the espresso is free today. And so, um, but if you would like uh, to grab um, an espresso drink between now and Sunday school, I mean, not now, now, I mean, after church, <laughs> Yeah, I saw that, Mr. Murray. Um, you, uh, you can do that this morning, and it's, it's our pleasure to, uh, to give that to you this morning. Next Sunday morning, because of the message uh, that will be delivered, we'll have a, a, a guest. Next Sunday is um, a kind of a, a mission Sunday and also a International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And so we're going to do things a little bit differently next week. So those of you especially that are watching at home, the message portion of the service next week will not be carried on the live stream. And so, uh, but everything, it'll, everything will be the same here to you, uh, but those of you that are watching at home, just be aware, don't, when things cut out around the message, uh, there's a reason for that with regard to sensitivity of, uh, of the topic and so forth. Um, and then next Sunday evening, in keeping with the theme of missions and prayer for the persecuted church and so forth, uh, we're going to screen a film at 6.30 next Sunday night um, that is entitled Ends of the Earth, uh, which has to do with Mission Aviation Fellowship and their workings and their outreach and so forth. And that'll be at 6.30 back here uh, in the sanctuary. So next Sunday night, uh, first Sunday in November, November 7th, 6.30 in the evening, Mission Aviation Fellowship. And I understand uh, we're hoping that they, there may be a representative from MAF along with a table with information. Uh, if, uh, if you have an interest in, uh, in uh, possibly supporting them, they uh, should be here next Sunday. But then again, the film um, at 6.30 next Sunday night. So I hope that you can come back and, uh, and join us for that. Um, as we go to prayer this morning, um, I'm going to use a portion of Psalm uh, 46. Psalm 46 was taken by Martin Luther and was put to music. Uh, I, I don't know the year of that, but today actually is Reformation Sunday, and it's, it, to me it's cool that it falls on a Sunday. 1517, actually probably the first trick-or-treater because uh, Luther was knocking on the door of Wittenberg Castle. I don't know if when they opened it, he said, hey, <laughs> trick or treat, or said it with a German accent, obviously. And um, actually, I saw a cartoon about that today, and they, they were making a play on words with the 95 thesis and Reese's pieces or something like that. I don't know. But the, the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, written by Luther, taken from Psalm 46, put to a popular drinking song of the day, as Luther was wont to do, and as he uh, put together some of the, uh, the hymns. Um, but um, a great statement of the strength uh, and the protection that's afforded us by God and the way he protects us. 
Luther put that to, to music, and it became um, just a, a very popular hymn that is still sung today. Uh, and so I'm using that this morning in the prayer, but just wanted to take a brief second just to highlight Reformation Sunday uh, today, 1517, the 95 Theses put on the wall or the door of Wittenberg Castle, which in that day and age, that was a way that you would summon the university community to get together and talk. You would just nail a notice to the door. Luther did that, not because he thought, scratched his head, boy, I think I'll start a revolution. It was Luther saying, hey, let's get together and let's talk about indulgences and, and what, uh, what we feel is right and isn't right within the church. And that was the trigger point for the uh, Protestant Reformation. And so um, cool, again, that that falls on a Sunday this morning. So with all of that in mind, would you join us as we join our hearts together in prayer? Let's pray together. You, O oh Lord, are our refuge and our strength. You are a very present help in trouble. Therefore, O oh God, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam though the mountains tremble at its swelling. These words, O Lord, penned by the psalmist were then transformed into Luther's great hymn by the reformer himself. And that hymn, Lord, is a great example of how you desire to take what is ordinary in our sight, like song lyrics, and place your stamp upon them. Indeed, O oh Lord, that is what you have done to us. You have taken us as ordinary yet created beings and have placed upon us the stamp of your image, making us yours from the most elderly to those yet to be born. The stamp of your image is upon us, and for that we are grateful. Yet, Lord, even being made in your image does not free us from the slavery to sin, but your son Jesus Christ has given to us a way out of the problem of sin. If we would but confess and agree with you and with your word that we have all sinned and fallen short. We know that you grant us a pardon. And so, Father, during these next few moments, would you hear us as we take a moment and in the silence confess before you? We thank you, Lord, for your forgiving love. And we come to you today, Lord, on behalf of those that struggle. Some have had surgery in this past week and are striving to recover. And Lord, we ask that you would bring them healing. For the many that are still struggling with uncertainty in their jobs and in their future, would you give them wisdom and discernment Bestow upon them direction. Ease their struggle and reassure them of your presence with them this day. For those, Lord, that might still struggle with this virus, we ask that you would give them your healing and that you would give them hope. Those that are dealing with side effects of the vaccine, we pray that you would strengthen them in this day and that you would bring them healing. And now, Lord, as your word is opened, as it is read, and as it is exposited this morning, may you be glorified in our presence. Direct your hearts, our hearts and speak to us each personally this day, for we expect to hear from you. And we know that it is your desire to communicate your grace to us. And so for that, we are anxious to receive and we posture ourselves in such a way that we would hear your word in our heart this morning. So speak to us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever read any of the things that kids pray for? 
Maybe you have seen some of those books, those compilations of children's prayers, some of them very poignant, but some of them also very funny. Things like, Dear God, my mom tells me you have a reason for everything on earth. I guess broccoli is just one of your mysteries. <laughs> or, Dear God, I need you to make my mom not allergic to cats. I really want a cat, and I really don't want to ask my mom to move out. <laughs> then there's this prayer. Dear God, could you put a holiday in between Christmas and Easter because there isn't anything there now. I guess President's Day was not a thing when he prayed. Dear God, thank you for the little brother, but I had actually asked for a puppy. So what about you? When you pray, what do you pray for? And in fact, let me drill down just a little bit deeper and ask you this question. Is Wabash Church on your prayer list? And if so, how do you pray for her? Have you ever wondered how to pray for the church. You know, there are a lot of things that you could pray for when you think about praying for the church. You could pray for growth. And by that, I mean spiritual growth, depth. I don't think there's anything wrong necessarily with praying for numeric growth so long as that numeric growth is not sheep swapping but is instead people coming to faith in Jesus Christ for the first time and growth that way. You could certainly pray for a spirit of cooperation, a spirit of unity amongst the members, especially in these days that, as we've all seen, can be somewhat divisive. The opposite of that prayer, disunity, is so destructive to a church. Francis Schaeffer once wrote that Christian unity is the final apologetic. He was referring to the prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17 when he said in verse 21, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Apologetics, proof of the re reality of God. Schaefer wrote this. He said, if an individual Christian does not show love toward other true Christians, the world has a right to judge that he or she is not. A Christian. See, the world's watching, and we prove the validity of our faith by how we treat one another. And certainly, the 17th chapter of John's Gospel, a great model of praying for the church, because that's what Jesus, in essence, does in that prayer. Among other things, he prays for the church. John 17, 20. Jesus prays, I don't ask for these only, meaning his disciples right there, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That would be us. Jesus prayed for us. And one of the things he prayed for was unity. And if you were to fast forward from John 17 up to the time of Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, which we've been looking at, Paul too models how it is that we should pray for the church. So before we get too far down the line, I'd like you to take your Bible and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5. We are nearing the end of our series on Thessalonians. 
which will take us right up to Thanksgiving and then on into Advent and then a new year, and that's far enough. <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. We'll just look at the first five verses this morning. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. So Paul, as he's closing this second letter, says, finally, brothers, that's Greek for I'm wrapping up now. Finally, brothers, Paul says, pray for us. It's not unlike prayer, uh, unlike Paul, rather, to ask for prayer. He's done it elsewhere in his writings. And in so doing, I think he's modeling something about how we can pray for the church, which might strike you strange in that he's addressing the church. But what he asks is for the church to pray for its leadership. Pray for us, he says. He's asking the church to pray for the leaders of the church, him, Silas, Timothy, those would be the us in this group. Pray for us. The starting point in praying for the church, I believe, is praying for those in leadership in the church. Pray for us. Pray for your staff, the elders, the deacons, Sunday school teachers, Awana leaders, trail life leaders, men's and women's Bible study leaders, life group leaders. The list could go on and on. Pray for us. Anyone in leadership, pray for your church by praying for the leaders of your church. Because the church will never grow spiritually beyond the depth of the leadership. The church will never grow spiritually beyond the depth of the leadership. And Paul requests two things when he solicits their prayers here. He says to pray for dispatch and pray for deliverance. First of all, the dispatch. And by that, I mean the dispatch of the word. Pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. Paul says. He asks them to first pray that the word is dispatched speedily. The word here would be used to describe someone who runs hastily and who has a free and open course in front of him. That's what this word means in Greek. Give the word speed and give the word a wide open course in which to run speedily. Paul here requests prayer for a speedy and un.
hindered spread of the word. Which would mean then doing away with obstacles like disunity. Because that will break the speed of the word. Do away with things like gossip or envy or rancor. And it occurs to me that if we invested ourselves in speaking to God about the church, we would spend less time complaining to others about the church. Because that kind of spirit will simply slow the spread of the gospel. Paul says, pray for them because they are the leaders. Pray for them so that the word is hastily dispatched without hindrance. And in addition, he says, pray that it would be honored in its dispatch. The word here means its innate glory is brought to light. You see, we don't have to make the word something. It is something. We just have to make sure that nothing blocks its light. It's another way of defining this word doxa or grace or glory. Pray that there is a centrality about the word whereby it's honored and it is treasured. I once had a conversation with an elder. This was in a previous church setting. He was bothered by a number of things going on in the church, and so I made an appointment to come and visit him at his home, and I brought another elder with me. And I went to his home and at one point asked him, just what is the crux of what's bothering you so much about our church? He was quite irate about a few things. So what's the bottom line? What's, what's really bugging you? And he looked at me and he said, it's your incessant use of the scriptures. <laughs> huh. But isn't that what it means to honor the word? That you speak the word. You exposit the word. You share the word. Praying that the leadership would be about the dispatch of the word of God, honored and dispatched with haste, so that it can run freely without hindrance. That's one way you can pray for the church. Lord, I pray that nothing would get in the way of the spread of the word and that it would be honored and central to everything that happens at Wabash. But not only dispatch, but there was another D in there, and it's deliverance. Verse 2, Paul says, pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. Evidently, the affliction that ran them out of Thessalonica within a three-week period is now following them to Corinth. Pray as we've encountered these evil men, perverse, aggressive, unrighteous, unreasonable. All of these are synonyms to describe those from whom Paul prays for deliverance. And because of the words that Paul uses here, these were folks that were not only satisfied with being corrupt themselves, they were intent on corrupting others 
and building a cadre of those that would like to take down the church. He kind of mustered the troops together. But lest you think these were just folks on the outside looking in, look at what Paul says next. He says, for not all have faith. But not all have faith. Could it be that Paul is giving a nod here in the direction of those within the church that were opposing him, and it's from these that he's seeking deliverance from inside. It certainly could be the way that it's phrased here. He's asking for deliverance from these evil folks, but they are within the walls. And if we were brutally honest, the vast majority of disunity does not spring from an attack outside the walls of the church. We're usually not in danger of our walls being breached from the outside. It's we within the church warring with ourselves more times than not, and imploding, if you will. Whether that's across the street with other churches or just across the pews with each other. As the comic strip once put it, we've discovered the enemy, and the enemy is us. Paul says, not all have faith. Pray for deliverance. But even if not everyone has faith, Paul says, the Lord is faithful. And his faithfulness is displayed two ways here. Paul says he will establish you and he will guard you. He'll establish you. The word here means to make you steadfastly secure. Some of you saw the very opposite of steadfastly secured when these series of storms recently came through in this last week. The, the dreaded bomb cyclone, as it was called. I commented to Elizabeth when that was happening, that I was glad that we had had the foresight to take down the large umbrella that was out on the deck blocking the sun for the summer months because it was about ready to go Mary Poppins on us. But somehow I had the, the, the frame of mind to take that down before the dreaded bomb cyclone came through. But gusty winds will quickly highlight what isn't secure and the winds of adversity do just that and they can do that within the church if things are not secure but we cling to a faithful god who establishes us but then he says that God will also guard us. It's a specific word that would have been used in a military context to guard against a violent attack from the outside. It can also be used to describe imprisonment, but in a good way, like guarded and kept safe. See, the very basis of Paul's confidence here is the fact that God is faithful, that he is trustworthy, is another translation of that Greek word. It's the word pistis, from which we get the word faith. One author referred to this section as an example of an inner security and an outward protection. And Paul states clearly, from whom we're protected. The author of the adversity that he's speaking of here is revealed at the end of verse 3. He says, the evil one. 
And I know you've heard this before, but it's a good reminder that what Paul says in Ephesians 6 is that our battle is not with flesh and blood, but it's with the schemes of the devil. And he would like nothing better than for any church, but us in particular, to argue and take sides in the church over things like masks and mandates and vaccines and exemptions and all of that. Instead, we need to stand firm on the word knowing that we're established and we are guarded by the God who is faithful. You see, praying for the church begins with praying for the leaders. But it also involves the leaders praying for the body. And in a very practical sense, that's one thing we do when we come together, the elders and the deacons, when we meet on a monthly basis. We spend some time, sometimes protracted, sometimes shorter, but all times focused on praying for you as the body of Christ. And so here, Paul, after he speaks of his confidence in the Lord, now prays for the church after having solicited prayers for himself and for those with him, he now turns it around and prays for them. Look in verse 5. He prays now for the Lord to direct their hearts. Straighten fully is the word used here. Straighten their hearts fully. Paul prays that their hearts have a straight and clearly directed route to two ultimate destinations, the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. What does it mean that your hearts are directed in these two directions? Well, I think it be begins with our knowledge that it's the heart that controls our passions. And so when we're praying for our hearts to be directed, that's going to control everything about us. That's the central part of who we are. And I'd say that being directed in the love of Christ implies the direction we take and the direction pointed toward us. In other words, it's a prayer that our ultimate aim is the love of Christ on behalf of others and that he's also praying that they would experience the love of Christ as well. They give it and they receive it. And in those moments when you're down, when you're wrestling with, with all of the various dysfunctions that have come over the past year, when things are just not clicking for you, recalling the love of Christ for you could be one of the answers. Remember what we saw last week. We talked about agape love. And we said that that was God finding his joy in you. And let me just reiterate that again a week later. When God looks at you, God finds his joy in you. That's what agape love means. And Paul prays that their hearts, the point of central control for their life, would direct their hearts to give and to receive the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. Patient endurance, but not having to do with people, but rather being able to hold up under situations and circumstances. That's what this word steadfastness means. It's Paul saying, we know what you're facing and we're praying for you to hang in there. One author said that this refers to the quality that does not surrender to circumstances or succumb under trial. Paul knows what they're facing and he prays for them that they would be steadfast in the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. And who better to pray for that 
for the Thessalonican church than the one who was run out of town three weeks into his church plant. And I know that some of you are nearly at that point just in life in general. You're ready to throw in the towel perhaps at work. You thought, boy, if there is ever a time to retire, it is now. There are others near you that feel the same way. Maybe some related to you. Close friends of yours. I spoke with a business owner in Enumclaw last week. I just said, hey, how's it going with all this stuff? You know, needing to check vaccine records and all of that sort of thing and monitoring your customers and so forth. She looked at me and teared up and said, I'm done. I am just done. I am so over it all, she said. She needs to hear of the love of Christ for her. And maybe you do as well today. So how do you pray for the church? Well, start by praying for its leaders. Pray for speedy dispatch of the word, unhindered. Pray for deliverance from the evil one because he'd like nothing better to get in and stir things up. And as leaders, know that we're praying for you. And we're praying that you're established and you're guarded. And that your hearts are directed to God's love and your hearts are directed to the steadfastness of Jesus Christ. And as we pray for each other, we know that he gets the victory. Let's pray together. Father, these are indeed difficult days. But we're reminded by Paul that you are faithful. That we serve a faithful God who holds true to his word, who holds true to his nature, who is love and who expresses agape love and finds his joy in us. May we find joy today in knowing that you find joy in us. Lift our hearts. Cause us to spread the love of Christ and the steadfastness of Christ to those around us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me and let's close out our worship in song.
Praise God. I hope you guys are praying for us. We're praying for you. Pray for the church in general. And uh, just a few things I want you to know before you go. We've got a couple of great Sunday school classes that we hope you can join us for. And we also have a great espresso machine that we hope you join us for. And stick around in the, in the lobby and just enjoy some fellowship this hour. Of course, you can always drop off your children over in Garrett Hall or in the youth room for a Sunday school hour for them. And we just hope that you use this hour for fellowship and for further edification of the church body and for your own souls and lives. Just stick around and be a family this hour. And please receive this blessing as I say it for you. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. You're dismissed, church. So when I fight, I'll fight.